Today, a look at White Canyon Software's Wipe Drive 9. Now, full disclosure here, uh, on occasion, White Canyon has placed an ad through Buy Sell Ads on my website. Now, the super server, the mini tower that's really common out there, has four empty drive bays. And you're supposed to, you know, maybe use a screwdriver, but you can actually just stick a drive, a three and a half inch drive I'm gonna use for this drive wipe demo in the bottom bay there. Let me get a picture of that out for you. Put that into the video. All right, next thing, we're gonna to wanna to get this software. So you can get a trial download and you get an ISO. Now in my case, I have ESXi booted here. So I'll need to uh, shut that down. And um, let me point a couple things out here. Things I want to point out are the uh, firmware and the BIOS on this thing. So this particular node that I'm taking down now, this particular node um, does not have a VMFS file system on that drive. So you would normally want to eject it or remove it from VMware if that's where your environment is. Um, and actually, when I did an interview with some folks from White Canyon, I actually did a pass-through, an NVMe pass-through. But for SATA, uh, that didn't seem to work. Also, uh, when I say pass-through, I mean, if you really have a data center machine that has a drive you want to wipe, you can pass an individual NVMe device through just fine to a VM. But today, I'm going to cover a much more common scenario. That would be mounting an ISO or using something like Rufus to create a bootable USB drive out of the ISO. But I'm going to use Java, um, and the reason why is this unfortunate timing where Supermicro has this firmware, this uh, IPMI, and it's really a Windows 10 build 1909 thing where I can't connect to network shares using the virtual media here. That'd be a whole lot better, but boy, it just doesn't currently work. So unfortunately, I'm stuck with Java. Yikes. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and mount the drive, and it brings up this, uh, this dialog here. Make sure you change to ISO type. Open the image. Okay, browse your way there. And plug it in. And click OK. Power it up. So obviously folks watching this video might own something different, right? You may be on a, a laptop or something, but in a mini tower where you've got four drive bays, you can kind of rest it on its side and just stick SATA drives in there and wipe four at a time, say. Now today I'm just going to wipe one drive. Now this bootable environment here, we'll keep tabs on it, but basically we want to go ahead and tell this particular motherboard, hey, on this boot and this boot only, please boot from an alternative boot source, not the usual uh, USB drive, which is where my ESXi hypervisor lives. I want to boot instead from a mounted ISO that's mounted over the network essentially right now. So um, in a few more seconds, the BIOS will prompt me for the key to do an alternate boot sequence. And we'll be building into a Linux environment that is rather rich, has a GUI, and that's the wipe drive software that you'll see momentarily here. Now, if you see 11, F11 right there, that's what we want, invoking boot menu. And it worked, it brought up the boot menu. Now we wait a little longer. There we go. So from the list, all I got to do is look for virtual CD-ROM drive. This would be for um, legacy BIOS type. This would be for UEFI BIOS type. Right now my machine is set to UEFI, so I'm going to pick that one. And soon we should see the ISO start coming up. Now it's a little slower because of a network boot. It'd be a little faster if you used you know, Rufus and mounted locally with a USB drive. All right, I don't know if you could read that very well. The contrast is kind of low on that screen, I'll, I'll admit. Uh, but it gave us different options for um, starting up Wipe Drive 9. I haven't had to use those. I just uh, wait for the timeout. It looks like it's about 5 or 10 seconds. And the default entry seems to work just fine. All right, at this point, I just want to cut over to the video, the interview. So this is Paul Brarin from Tinkertry here, and you'll see White Canyon on the phone with me. Well, we got a web meeting. Hey, Nathan Jones, can you hear me okay? Hi, Paul. Hey. I'm doing great. 
All right, so you offered to help me see a little about how people who visit my site might want to request your code, first of all. And in the past, uh, part of how um, I noticed your company, uh, well, you did run an ad at one point, like lots of ads, they come and go, but there's a lot of synergy here where I saw that your product runs in a VM. So I seem to be, it's kind of a nerdy way to get it going, but without having a reboot or just leaving a host running, I actually managed to take a Samsung 960 and pass it through to VM and and there you go. I have a way to demo your code. So we're about to go through what your code looks like when it boots. And if you could talk us through a little bit about that, but first, how do people you know, get the code? So Nathan, uh, if you could introduce yourself and then we'll talk about how people who view this video would go about getting a trial of your code. Yeah, thanks Paul. Uh, good to be talking with you. Um, so we'd obviously love to, love to help out your users here. Um, we have a tool where the, where the highest certified, we're the most trusted, we're used by the US House, Senate, White House, Department of State, Los Alamos Nuclear Laboratories. I mean, it goes across the gamut. Um, happy to, uh, to let people play around with this. So if you just want to fire us off an email to sales at whitecanyon.com and uh, just go ahead and put uh, Tinker Try in the subject line, be happy to get them uh, 10 or 20 uses for them to play around with. Cool. I see this request the trial button today. Is Can you compare and contrast shooting an email with this? Is there any reason they... Yeah, same they, thing. Same thing, okay. Tell us more and just put uh, saw you on Tinker Try and we'll be happy to get you some free uses of the software. All right, great. And then the other thing people ask, because they might do this on a weekend, what happens if it's Saturday and their kids are sleeping and they fired up their home lab? They're waiting till Monday to get a license key or, or can they kick the tires in the meanwhile? Or how does that work? Yeah, so you can actually use it without uh, putting in an activation code. It won't actually let you wipe the drive, but you can see everything else besides the actual process of the wiping completing. Nice. Okay, let's get into the product then. So now I'm going to fire up my vSphere HTML5 interface. And I've got a VM here that I have created, and I'll just point out the settings of it. So I'll be covering this in a separate video of how do you set this up, like in a home lab. But basically, I have a PCIe device, a NVMe drive, a Samsung 960 passed right through to this Windows 10 VM I've created. And the White Canyon software is mounted as an ISO. It's a, a variant of Linux that's going to boot. So that's, that's really the setup. Let's go ahead and get into what it looks like booting. Um, and I'll, I have some notes to make here, and that is, this is not a supported config. This is me, you know, tinkering with a creative way to avoid rebooting a server that I use for a lot of projects and just seeing if I could see an existing drive in there that had no data I care about. It's got a VMFS file system on there and a few files. I'm ready to nuke it live on this, you know, phone call slash web meeting we've got going here. And that's what I figured, uh, why not record something with Nathan? And um, so, Nathan, you're now seeing your environment boot. This screen yeah. gives some alternate view, uh, video modes, but I'm going to not touch anything and just let it rip with the defaults. Exactly. Just, just for a little bit of background, so we're running on a customized live Gen 2 Linux kernel here. So it's going to load up everything that it needs uh, live into the, uh, the RAM of the uh, VM. Great. And we saw a couple of penguins there briefly, so I gave this two v virtual CPUs. Doesn't really matter. <laughs> I don't think you care too much about CPU grunt given to this video. No. Now, what we do is pretty uh, non-intensive. Do you have see. minimum specs listed somewhere? RAM, you know, what kind of... Actually, minimum specs are going to be quite minimum. I uh, just need to have at least uh, two gigs of RAM. That's really the only requirement. Everything else would just be a little faster, a little slower. Okay, great. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, blur this part out. But what I'm doing is the license key that's actually hitting the internet. If you watch carefully while Nathan was talking, the TCP IP stack did load. So I didn't have to do anything special. This uh, VM just works. It sees the internet and it uses the cloud to activate and boom, we're in. So very straightforward. And I'll just point out that um, I don't currently have the mouse working. It might be something we'll look into, but you're gonna hear me hitting tab on my keyboard and turning off the checkbox on my USB drive. Why am I doing that? Well, my USB drive is where my hypervisor, my VMware is actually installed. And you can see the word VMware there, the vendor column, right? So the drive we really wanna have a look at here is the one that is highlighted at the top with the checkbox, and that's the Samsung 960 Pro. So it shows the model, the type, the size, and everything. Um, and you'll notice it, uh, hmm, it says SED. So self-encrypting drive is the acronym. Nathan, that's a, this is a consumer drive. I'm a little surprised it's showing it as SED. Do you have any idea why it's showing that flag? Uh, I sure. Um, it, it may be just a, a flag that we're, that we're detecting Essentially, we're pulling uh, we're pulling uh, data 
uh, the smart data from there. And so if it's identifying as a self-encrypting drive, that's why we're flagging it that way. So I'm, I'm imagining that that has something to do with uh, um, the smart data that we're pulling. Okay. So again, reminding the audience here, this is completely unsupported and that this is a consumer drive that you're really not supposed to have in a VMware environment anyway, a multi-user OS, but the price is way lower. So it's pretty common in a home environment to be unsupported officially by VMware in this case and by um, White Canyon here. Because again, normally you would just boot an ISO or you'd make a USB bootable device or CD-ROM. What do you see users booting from, Nathan? They're typically burning a CD literally on an, on an old server and firing it up yeah. to do drive wipes? Oh. Yeah, you can run it from a, a CD or a, from a USB thumb drive. Um, if you're going to be doing them in large quantities, set up a Pixie server and boot the, boot the devices to that to, uh, to get their instructions. So it depends on, on what kind of scale you're looking to, to run it. You obviously have a lot more insight in how you could scale that up in, uh, on the VM side. Do you help the user create a bootable USB media or do you just give them an ISO and leave it to them to use something like Rufus or whatever to transform it into right. bootable? <laughs> Bingo, yeah. So we will recommend, hey, just take the ISO file, uh, create the create a bootable USB with the Rufus tool, and then when you're uh, when you're creating when you set your settings like where you what type of logging you want, where you want that saved, that'll all be uh, saved to the USB drive. All right, Rufus is definitely something I've uh, covered. This is an ancient article, but you know people uh, have used that tool for a long time. No problem. Fantastic. All right. Work, works great. All right, so let's move on. Um, I already have Next highlighted here, you'll see. So I'm just going to hit Spacebar and get my mouse focused back into that window. Hit Spacebar, and now we're on the next screen. And what I'm going to do is tab to the drop-down menu to show there's a lot of options here. Let me see if I got that right. Okay, so it turns light blue when I've got it highlighted. And I think I want to hit Spacebar, and there we go. Nathan, uh, if you could explain some of these... To the yeah, for sure. So we work with companies across the planet. There's a number of different uh, major data security patterns that we support. Uh, we, we support everything that's uh, from, from uh, North America, from Europe. Uh, there's some Israeli ones, some Russian ones in there. Everybody's got kind of their own take on what constitutes a proper wipe. Uh, we highly recommend the NIST 888R1. It's the wipe pattern that's being used by so the major uh, federal customers that I was uh, listing off earlier. Uh, it's essentially, it's the modern equivalent, it's a modern replacement for the DOD 5220.22 slash M. So we recommend it, it's a proper overwrite that makes sure that you hit all of the wear leveling areas, the device configuration overlays, host protected areas. It's gonna make sure that we, we hit everything on there. So even if you were, and this doesn't quite apply to VMs like a wood or an actual physical uh, SSD, but um, some labs can do chip off attacks on SSDs and, and read raw data from them. And this NIST uh, standard uh, certifies that you're you're going to be hitting every part of that. And even a, 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 a high level recovery operation in a lab couldn't recover data from the raw chips there. So that's the, that's the standard that uh, nearly all of our federal customers are currently using. They've all moved that direction. All right. So some other products out there, people in a home lab might use something called uh, Secure Erase for MVME, which basically does a, a, a quick tossing out of the data, basically saying, hey, Samsung, I want nothing to show anymore. It's not actually doing a, a multiple rewrite wipe like we're used to with spinning drives, or in this case, that's, SSDs, correct? That's correct. And, yep. and, we, and the NIST uh, standard takes into account that there are some flaws in the Secure Erase command. In fact, the replacement command, uh, which is sanitized device, uh, is what's required for hitting that higher NIST standard. There's two standards. There's clear and purge. I don't know if we want to go into that too much, but purge is the highest standard. It means that there's no type of data recovery that can be done. Clear means that there's no software recovery that can be performed on that on that device. So we, uh, the NIST standard is using the more modern sanitized device command to hit that higher standard. All right, so I'm going to hit down arrow just to show all of them, and then we'll decide together for a half terabyte uh, drive here, which one you know might finish in a reasonable time frame while we're recording. Um, it looks like my clock is almost 6 p.m., and then in the VM it's showing as 11 p.m. All right, that's interesting. That's just, uh, it's showing UTC time. It's showing what it is in England right now. Okay, there's all your stuff in the list. 
yes. which one which one would you recommend we try live where I'm about to nuke the data? Um, yeah, we'll score do the single override. It's fine. This one? Uh, the, the NIST over, yeah. And, okay. then, and you can go ahead and hit, hit OK on that. I'll okay. explain kind of the difference between this, the single and the NIST. Okay, so I hit single overwrite. Next is highlight. Do you want me to go ahead and hit spacebar and continue with this while you're talking, or you want to explain something first? Yes, please. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. So Thank obviously it's, it's highlighting it. This is a process that's irreversible. Once you've done this, it's over. The data is going to be gone, cannot be recovered. It's the whole point of... Uh, of the, of the software tool. So right now, this is your point of, yeah, of no return. So once you click wipe now, the process will start, should get done quite quickly. All right, love it. This is actually the first time I've seen this window. Everything else led up to this. Now I'm, I'm doing the wipe now. Accessing license key, you briefly saw echoed. A nice progress bar. This is pretty slick so far. Um, we'll see how long it takes. It says, do not turn off. Yeah, do not turn off. You expect that. I'm on a UPS battery, by the way. Anyone listening, anytime you do something like this, uh, firmware updates or dry wipes, all of that, you should be on a battery. Just just saying. All right, let's see what happened. 100% there, just leaped up and finished. That was very fast. That's It's very fast. Essentially, we, we uh, the, the, uh, the device controller can flip all, uh, essentially all those bits all at once, and so it, it can be very quick. Platter-based drives are, are, are definitely a, a whole lot slower. I mean, again, that doesn't apply to VMs uh, directly. But uh, so this last screen is just if you want to create a report that'll say, hey, this device was say, was wiped to this spec, started at this time, ended at this time. And it's required for a lot of, if you're, if you're running, uh, if you're dealing with sensitive information, if you're dealing with HIPAA information or sent, you know classified data, you're going to want to have that uh, report that's going to detail the process that you did and and the the uh, um, the details around that that process. All right. Well, uh, my question there is, how do we get it out of this uh, environment? How do you? I'm going to go ahead and hit enter. It'll show me some options on where it'll save it. Or yeah, so you can just you can actually just uh, te- uh, there it is. Nice. Yeah, so it'll give you an option if you'd like to save that out. Uh, different different options there on the reporting. You want just something simple. You can use a delimited file. If you want something that looks pretty, you got a PDF, a nice PDF certificate. Um, if you're doing this in, on a large scale, uh, recommend you set up a MySQL or an MS SQL database. That way, you can get some some more sophisticated uh, reporting uh, on your on your white processes. All right, most people watching this would probably have a simple window share if they're doing it in a small environment. But if they're going to rehearse this properly for their work environment, uh, I would agree with you. They're probably doing Pixie for boot without any media. And they're probably thinking about uh, where they're going to save the log files and maybe even setting up an SMTP gateway or something. Whatever works for your environment. Obviously, you have all the options covered. I'm going to try to, uh, let's see. I think that's about it. I'm going to cancel actually saving the log. Um, and... I think we shut off all the basic functionality. This went well. I'm going to go ahead and shut down. Is there anything else I missed before I shut this VM down? Nope, that's it. All right, nice. So it should shut down. We're probably going to see uh, Linux go down in a moment here. And um, Nathan, uh, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Great talking with you, Paul. Thank you.